First of all, um, I want to talk about um, teamwork in the project, and I want to talk about pair programming, and then we'll um, eventually get to talking about some interesting new data structures we haven't seen yet. Do you remember when we were looking at trees, when we just left lists and we started to look at binary trees, we were very excited because trees gave us all sorts of benefits. In particular, they convert some, something that was n, that was linear, to something that was log n. So to every extent that we could use a tree, we were interchanging n's with log n's, which is a wonderful difference to make. But we could only do that if an assumption was wet. Do you remember what the assumption was? Someone said it? Yeah? Oh, I haven't put a mic. Oh. Balanced. Yeah, yeah, the tree's got to be balanced. Is that what you said? If the tree's unbalanced, because a linked list is a sort of a tree, in a way. It's a tree with every left child null or every right child null. That's still a tree, but it's a linked list, and that's got linear performance. So it's possible for trees to be crap and unbalanced. But if a tree's balanced, and by balanced we mean Risk? Oh, did I just rub out risk? Donahue versus Stevenson, oh, my favourite. That's in the exam. I've got to rub this out before you see it. A tree's balanced. This is not a balanced tree. This is not a balanced tree. This is a balanced tree. They're pictures, what does it mean? What do we mean by balanced tree? Actually, that is balanced in some sense, isn't it? If you put a pivot in the middle, it'd stay balanced. But what do we actually mean by balanced tree? All the um, elements are spread out. The elements are spread out as much as possible, yeah. Um, yep, that's right, that's, that's a characteristic of it. Can we, let's, there's lots of different ways of saying it. Can someone say it a different way? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, and what were you going to say? Yeah, that's right. Um, the property we want is not only is the um, maximum depth on the left equal to the maximum depth on the right, but uh, for the root node, but we'd like that property be, to be true for all the nodes in the tree as much as possible. And another way of saying that, and really what we're really after, is we want to constrain the depth of the tree. We want the tree to be as filled in as possible, and we want the depth of the tree to be as short as possible. Uh, ideally, the depth of the tree is going to be order log n log to the base 2 of n. Oh, that's what we're hoping for. So that's a balanced tree. If we've got a tree that's balanced, and it doesn't have to be exactly balanced, just has to be reasonably balanced, um, then we get log n. And it turns out if you generate a tree randomly, and what do I mean by that? I mean, um, suppose you've got a, bi uh, um, a binary search tree, so an ordered tree, and you're sticking things into it. And you know the order, the sequence in which you stick the things will determine the shape of the tree. There are lots of ordered given a set of n items, there are many ways of putting that into a tree and having the tree satisfy the sorted property. The sorted property is just that all children on the right side of a node have keys less than or equal to the parent, and all children on the left side of the node have keys greater than the parent, or move the equal side to the other side if you prefer. So that's the sorted property. There are many, there's no, it's not uniquely defined. There's many, many ways of building um, a tree given a series of, um, uh, a, a set of elements to insert into the tree. And um, if you just use the standard insertion algorithm, then the shape of the tree that you get depends on the particular sequence you use to insert them. So if you insert them in an ordered sequence, if you insert the smallest one, then the next smallest, and the next smallest, what shape will you get? What's that? A tree to the, to the right or to the left? I can't remember which way I said. Yeah, you'll get, it'll degenerate into a line. If you insert them randomly, it turns out on average, 
not even on average, with high probability, so it's exceedingly likely to be the case, high probability has a precise meaning, but let's just say it means uh, exceedingly likely. Um, if we insert them in a random order, then we'll get a tree that's reasonably balanced and we'll get our log 2 property that we really want. So for most ways of sticking the guys in the tree, we end up with a reasonably balanced tree. Suppose you're writing an ADT or some sort of data structure and you're supplying a, t a tree as your way of implementing this thing and it has to put data, it's somehow some sort of dictionary or something like that. So items have to go in and you want to be able to extract them quickly. And you'd like to be able to extract them in, in logarithmic time. And you're setting up this ADT. What's, a tree would be perfect. That's going to let you extract things in linear time because you'll be able to find them sort of by the key in linear time provided the tree's balanced. What's the danger we face if we set up an ADT like that? Yes? If the, data if the data comes in sorted, yeah. Or we could even be more general than that. But I like to concentrate on the phrase you said, if the data comes in, because I think that's really important too. That we are writing the ADT, but the effectiveness of the ADT depends on the person that uses the ADT. It's something we don't have full control over. So if the person using it decides to stick things in in order, or close to water, or in some sort of way with not much entropy in it, then we could get a degenerate case in poor performance. So we're sort of removing moving responsibility from us to the user. So we could say to the user, here's an ADT, by the way, don't insert items in sorted order. Can you see that is simultaneously quite a legal thing to say? You're allowed to say that. Putting that requirement onto the user, that's legal. But what else would you want to say about that requirement? It's crazy. <laughs> I heard someone say that. I agree, it's crazy. It's not a good requirement. Normally, I guess you can come up with pathological cases where it'd be fine. What's the problem with putting a requirement like that on the user? What's that? They're not going to. We know human nature. Uh, they might not be able to. It might be beyond their control. Maybe they're getting data from a third party. So they might have no choice over it. And even if they did, they're going to forget or they're not going to do it. If we tell them to do it and they don't do it, whose fault is it? No, 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 no. We're writing the ADT. We say it's got to satisfy some property for the ADT to work. They don't satisfy the property. Whose fault is it? It's the user's fault. It's their fault. So in terms of blame, we can easily blame them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yet we also in our hearts know it's a stupid requirement and we're sort of setting them up to fail. I could leave a pack of open razor blades at home and tell the girls, and when they have their kindy friends over, to ask them to tell their kindy friends not to play with them. They're old enough to understand um, rules and restrictions and they understand the words when I say not to play with them. So in a sense, whose fault is it if they play with the razor blades? Well, in a strict legal sense, in a sort of Shylock sense, it's their fault. But why don't I ever do that? Because they would be to blame were they to cut themselves limb from limb. But I don't do it. Why don't I do it? I don't want them to do that. Why don't I want them to do that? And they're my kids. I love them. But what about the other kids at kindy? Some of them I don't like. They're obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't I do that with other kids that aren't my kids? What's that? No reason, really. Um, there's got to be a reason, because no one ever does it. Uh, I, I reckon, I mean, probably there are legal uh, reasons there. Uh, you probably. Uh, I, although I think they're responsible and able to follow instructions, the law might be a bit more uh, compassionate. Uh, but I think the reason is we don't just... The whole way of living life isn't just a way of avoiding blame. Life isn't always about covering your butt so you're not the one at fault or responsible. Sometimes we want to achieve a good effect. 
You can probably think of many more examples than I could go through of people that technically cover their butts and do something that's legally right and they're not to blame, yet they diminish society or the world or the kids at kindergarten or something by their actions. I, I could always put all sorts of warnings up. In fact, lots of medicine when you buy it these days comes with, you, you read the disclaimer, it's like nine pages long. It unfolds to a parachute and it's all in tiny small print. And if I take that uh, medicine and it has a nasty side effect, the drug companies have covered their butts because they'll say, but look here on um, paragraph one kilometer into the text, <laughs> it says this. Or when you get any software from anyone, there's this click I agree to this ridiculously long <laughs> list of things. And you, you know, you've got to use software, you've got to click you agree, but it's not really fair, is it? Because um, in a sense, while they're avoiding legal blame for things going wrong, probably if you write software, you should make it correct. And if you make medicine, you should make it so it doesn't have side effects. And they should be really your top concerns and priorities and so on and so on. So somehow, blame and responsibility doesn't quite capture things. Although in a simplistic world, it would. It doesn't quite capture things exactly. If I was, let me make it um, really clear to those of you with, as yet, <laughs> nothing but self-interest guiding you. Let's suppose there are some people here who are, um, uh, uh, you know, only think of themselves and just care about how things benefit them. Um, you might say, I don't care if the kids cut themselves or something, or something, or something, or something. But what about this? I could say, we're on a submarine. It's someone's job to shut the turret before you descend. And it's your job to feed the guinea pigs. You're walking along. You're about to descend. You look up, the turret hasn't been shut, shut properly. Do you say, ha, 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 he's going to get in trouble for that? <laughs> Sometimes your interests align with their interests. If you're working in a big team or a big software project and things don't fail and things don't work, although it might not be your fault, you're going to suffer. So you sort of want to make it work. If you're in a big company and uh, you're working on installing a massive new banking system. And you're working on the user interface and you're working on the security and you're working on something and you're... Although in theory everyone's working on their separate things and I don't care if they survive or fail, I just have to cover my own button, make sure I meet my requirements. You can probably see we would really like it if the whole thing worked. It would be, be benefits to me in all sorts of ways if the whole thing worked because I'd feel proud of my software and feel proud of the whole thing we all collectively built. Plus, it'd be benefits to the bank and, the, and there'd probably be ongoing work. And so there, there'd be all these benefits to me, but also just general benefits. So, um, yeah, yeah, okay. So I would say this issue of working out the right thing to do and the best approach, when technically you don't have to, we're sort of drifting into that realm of design. What's a good design for something? And I think I've mentioned to you before the idea of you could put a sign on the door if you're designing a building, and the door could say main entrance. Have I told you this before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say the sign main entrance and not make it clear it's a main entrance, and then you sort of discharge your responsibility, and if someone can't find the main entrance, it's their fault. Like if someone gets lost in old main building, it's their fault because there are maps around. But maybe we could have designed the thing more sensibly and come up with a more sensible design that has broader criteria. So these questions of design, not just about right and wrong and blame, but to coming up with a whole overall system that works really well and pleasingly, these are computing design questions, or not just in computing. And we will be looking at them extensively in the next course. 2911 is all about design. It's not just about being right or wrong or passing or failing, which is this course, yeah, correctness. The next course is about okay, but this is a really good system that works really well and these things all seem to pass the test but put together their crap. So we're trying to look at good designs. Okay, um, I've got a quote here from Bruce Schneier. Oh, no, actually it's not from Bruce Schneier. Bruce Schneier is an awesome uh, security person and he was writing about um, how mem copies now being banned at Microsoft. I'll g give you some light. Oh, not that you'll be able to read it anyway. It's too small. But let's give you some light anyway. Can you read that? Memcopy, the memcopy command. In May, Microsoft announced they're finally banning memcopy. It's one of the dangerous C commands that um, has just led to millions and millions of vulnerabilities in their code. And their code, as you know, is often riddled with bugs, or in the old days more than now, but still there's legacy bugs throughout it. And Microsoft, to their credit, are trying to do a lot to uh, improve the quality of their crap code. And, 
And, and they're being largely successful in their efforts, I've got to say. You know, they credit to them, though. Um, uh, you know, it's a pity they got to this situation, but actually they're doing a really good job in getting themselves out of it at the moment. And one of the things they're doing is banning certain commands. Like our style guide, they're saying, don't use these commands, they're just dangerous. You could use memcopy safely. The problem is you can also use it badly. And I guess the decision Microsoft's making is we could ask our designers to use it in a safe way, and if they stuff up, it's their fault and we'll fire them. But if they stuff up, it's also bad publicity for our otherwise spotless products. So we actually um, don't want to have, we're not interested in just allocating blame, we're interested in actually solving the problem. So here's a comment that someone said. Uh, where's the one I wanted to find? Some interesting comments. Yeah, Ted's comment. Todd. The big problem with the prohibition is that it's not mem copy that's the problem. Shh, shh, shh. The problem is programmers who don't think about buffer lengths while writing code, who simply don't bother doing the work to check sizes correctly. For instance, when passing a destination buffer into a function, rather than going, oh, I don't know its size, I need to change the API to pass in it in so that my function can uh, check whether the destination's big enough, they say, I don't know the size, so it's the caller's responsibility to pass in a big enough buffer. Gee, that made my job easier. Banning memcopy won't help because programmers like that will continue to find ways not to think about it no matter what you do. You'll either do nothing to help the problem or you'll make the code with the problem in it more obscure and hard to, hard to spot. stop. Uh, he's saying, really, the fundamental problem here is a poor design problem. That we could solve this property when you are designing an interface and it's got a flawed there's a flawed interface you're implementing and the size of where you're copying the memory isn't specified, so an overwrite could attack, could happen. You, there's two solutions. One is you could say, well, we'll change the interface and fix it up so it's a safe use of the function. Or the other one is to say, well, I'll just put a requirement that the user has to pass in the right amount of memory. It's up to the user to check. And that's the sort of discussion we we're having a second ago. You can see that if you said it's up to the user to check that there's enough memory, you've washed your hands, your hands are clean, you're not to blame if something goes wrong, it's a stupid user, but you also know you're giving them razor blades to play with, and you're setting yourself up, and they are going to stuff it up, quite seriously. So we have this um, exact problem, and we have the same problem with trees and balanced trees, that we could ask someone else to keep the trees balanced for us, but in practice they won't. Maybe they have no control over it, maybe they do. Here's, if we had full control, here's what we could do. We could say, I'm going to insert this data into a tree. And I want the tree to be balanced, so I'm going to get really fast lookups. So what I'll do is I'll just randomly shuffle the data first, like we did with randomized quicksort, and I'll insert it in a sort of random order, and then with high probability the tree's going to be balanced. Cha -ching. That's a pretty good approach. What do you think of that? Rather than letting the user specify um, the um, ordering, we'll do it ourselves randomly up front, and then we sort of win. Let me make this really, make it really clear. Suppose we've got, um, I'm running a shop which sells clothes. A very fashionable shop that sells clothes. What's the name of a fashionable shop that sells clothes? As if I didn't know. Target. Okay. Target. <laughs> no, no. What is a fashionable shop? Maurice's menswear, someone says. On Marrickville Road. Okay. Maurice's menswear. On Marrickville Road. The three M's. Now, Maurice keeps in his shop a database of all his items in his shop stored and, and uh, every item has a barcode on it. He allocates a, a stock number to everything. And he wants to be able to quickly look up and see if things are in there or not. Um, and he wants to be able to add clothes and subtract clothes as clothes are bought and sold because it's a clothing exchange shop and not because he buys new stock every now and then. So he decides to implement it with a binary tree. He has a dictionary-like structure with a binary tree, and when, you add, when he gets more stock, he adds it into the tree, and when he sells stock, he pulls it out of the tree. He's just about to set up shop, and I've warned him about binary trees. He has all his clothes there with barcodes on it. How's he going to enter the data into the database? He's going to pay some kid to do it. What does he say to the kid? Just start on the right and move along, entering the items until you get to the end? That's a sort of sensible workflow. What's the problem with that, though? 
groups. Well, they might be arranged in groups. Maybe all the genes are together and all the knickerbockers are together. And, all the, and maybe the serial numbers have been allocated in the same way. Maybe when he sat up dreaming of serial numbers, he allocated serial numbers when a new, a new Knickerbocker shipment came in. So all the Knickerbockers, because they all arrived together, ended up with serial numbers that were sort of similar. And now he's keeping them together in the shop. So when they're going in, he's entering them in serial. So this is what we mean by um, entropy and lack of entropy. You can see this sort of order in the way the clothes arrive at the shop. And now there's going to be some order in the way the kid enters the numbers into the shop. And human beings, we just can't help it. Every time we touch something, we put order in it. So this order is going to be preserved in some way. And I'm sure the obviously is going to arrange it in such a way it's going to count against us and we're going to end up with an unbalanced tree. So what would you tell the kid? How would you enter the items in? Throw them in the air? Let them land on the ground? Pick things up randomly and enter them in? That's what I did. He didn't like it. But I explained the uh, algorithmic advantages of it. You can, you can see it's sort of hard. OK, so suppose he enters the goods in a random order, um, because that's a requirement we put on it. We said, we're using a tree, but we're going to make it the user's problem. So now we're entering the goods in random order. Now, uh, sh 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 everything is fine. Our tree, with high probability, if we did enter them in random order, except for our clothes being a bit dirty from throwing them on the floor, our tree is now reasonably balanced. But we haven't actually solved the problem, because what's going to happen now? What happens next? He's going to start selling clothes. Who has a pair of knickerbockers at home? Oh, I should rephrase that. Who has a shortage of knickerbockers at home? Everyone. You're all going to realize it in a rush when knickerbockers are on TV, and you're going to go out and get your knickerbockers. And all the knickerbockers are going to go. But no one buys, what's something really daggy? T-shirts with the wild, where the wild things are on. No one buys them anymore, so they're all going to stay. So over time, entrance and exits from the database are not going to be random. There's going to be a lack of entropy in how we update and maintain our tree. And he'll get new shipments, and they won't come in random order. Suddenly, one day, the, the um, T-shirt truck will turn up, and he'll just add a whole lot of T-shirts in. So it's possible that even if initially you entered it completely out of order, that over time, There'll just be order in the way the thing is accessed. And slowly the tree will start to move and it will become less and less balanced and eventually it will move to an unbalanced state. And although if we were doing it completely randomly, the chance of that happening is very low, unfortunately, if we're not doing it randomly, if the um, accesses on the database are coming out of human beings or anything, human beings have had anything to do with it, the probability shifts to be remarkably higher that we'll move to an unbalanced tree. I mean, it could even just be that over time, he um, adds serial numbers chronologically into the database, and just naturally he'll end up selling his old stock and he'll end up buying new stock. So the tree is going to start shifting to one side because we're going to the age of the, the the average purchase date of the stuff in his stock will increase over time. And so if um, the serial numbers uh, increase with date, then you'll see the tree will start to shift that way a fair bit over time. Um, so just natural processes, not natural processes, human processes will bugger it up. OK, so we need to somehow solve Maurice's problem. But before we talk about that, I'd like to talk a little bit about teamwork. Oh, 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 before I even talk about teamwork, I was thinking as I was coming in of the two different approaches, the blame sort of approach and the doing something about it approach. And the doing something about it approach, I think, is you know that excellent song, Kick the Ball? Kick the ball, kick the ball. Doesn't matter if you're big or small, you know, you've got to kick the ball. It's sort of triumphant and you're jumping in and you're doing something about it. It's fantastic. And the sort of complaining, whingy thing, I've got this song from the 80s. You guys are probably too young for this song. That's me. Do you all know this song? He's been waiting, waiting. He's waiting. They haven't seen him. He's still waiting. He's being pushed around, though not obviously. He gets to his feet and he says, What about me? It isn't fair. Had enough. Now I want my share. Okay. You pathetic person. 
whinging, complaining, whining. I'm just standing around and no one's looking after me. What about me? It's not fair. Why isn't the world doing the right thing by me? Come on, guys, it's not fair. You gotta, you know, give me stuff. No way. He should be out there kicking the ball. He should be doing something about it. So sure, technically, maybe, uh, maybe there's something wrong and the shopkeeper should have served him before the other person. But if the shopkeeper serves people in the wrong order, are you just going to sit there and bitch about it? Or are you going to move to the front and look scary and say, hey, it's my turn now, or out of the way, or some, you know, you somehow got to solve the problem rather than just complaining about the problem. Now, um, my uh, wife recently has been employing, uh, sitting on a panel interviewing people in her firm for jobs. And one of the questions they always ask is about group work, because they want to see how the people work in teams. And she said, it's very interesting when I told her about today's lecture. I actually planned today's lecture last week, I've got to say. Though as I give it, a lot of you are going to think, oh my god, he's talking about me because you've contacted me in the last few days about some problem or other. And he's now made a lecture particularly about me rather than talking to me face to face. But actually, this is a lecture that um, actually I gave at the beginning of the year as well. Um, did anyone do Eng 1000? Have you heard me talk about group work? Yeah. Oh, put up your hands if you've already heard me say group work. And, and put up your hands if you didn't hear me say it at Eng 1000. Oh, OK, so nearly half the people, oh, awesome, well done, OK. Shh, shh, shh. So for those people who already know all about group work, your challenge is to find palindromic squares. Numbers that read the same forwards and backwards and are square numbers. And find them as quickly as you can. But those that haven't heard about group work, don't pay attention to those people. Listen to this lecture. And my wife said, uh, they always ask a question about group work. Because they want, they're a team, her company. Everyone has to work in teams. And they say, have you ever had an experience, now this is a sneaky interviewing question, have you ever had any experience where group work hasn't worked? Where you've been in a team and it hasn't worked? Now, we all know that's exactly the same as asking the question, have you ever been in a team? And then, she, then they say, tell us about it and what went wrong. But they don't want to know what went wrong. What do they want to know? What you did to fix it up. But they don't say that in the question. And so she said, well, it's funny. Most people just sit there and start bitching about, oh, I did this, and someone else didn't do that, and this didn't happen, and that wasn't right. And if they're a control freak at the end, they'll say, so I had to do it all myself. And they're just going cross on the application form. Or they'll say, so I just grumbled, and the thing failed, and it was their fault. And I wasn't at fault. It was their fault. And they're thinking cross. And she said she had a boy come uh, the last time they interviewed, and he was um, not from a private school, he was from a poor school, and he didn't look sort of, didn't scrub up so nicely and things like that. And, you know, all the sort of posho people doing the interview were going, oh, scruffy boy. But they said, asked about the teamwork, and the kid said, well, yeah, I was in a team and it didn't work. Yeah, yeah, there were all these problems. But I realized early on there were going to be problems. I could just see from the way the people were. So I, I put these things in place so that when the problems arose, we'd be able to deal with them. Now, some of the people still didn't do it, and there was all this sort of bitching in the groups, but I arranged this and that, and the guy was just sort of talking through it. And then they said at the end, so did it work? And he said, well, it sort of worked. You know, we got closer, um, but I think if I did it again, next time I'd do blah, 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 blah. And they just go tick, 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 tick. Because in a firm, they don't care about blame. Firms aren't about blame. Firms aren't about who's right and who's wrong. Firms are about making lots of money. <laughs> so the firm has to work. It has to be a success. It's not about the individuals in the firm, it's about the whole... So they want someone who's going to make things work. Because when you have more than one person, sometimes even when you have just one person, there's going to be disagreements and problems. <laughs> and the trick is, what do you do when you have these disagreements and problems? Do you grumble about them? And sure, that's an appropriate thing to do. I don't mean to say just give up and you have to put up with it. But do you try and fix a problem? Is that your number one criteria? Or is your number one criteria just establishing who's at fault? Now, um, 
When I spoke to, uh, and I've got to say now, I'm distinguishing between pair programming and group work here. In your current project, I'm hoping you're going to be doing pair project programming. I've sort of thrown it up to you as a challenge to do pair programming, which is where you both work together all the time jointly, one of you typing, one of you watching. In cases like that, there's no group work problem. You're both there just working on it. But I suspect a lot of you aren't going to embrace the pair programming option this time. I'm hoping maybe you'll embrace it in the next course because I'll offer it again as an option and we'll give, I'll have some people coming in talking about how to do it and their experiences in the next course. But if you're doing group work where one of you is doing one half of the work and one of you is doing the other half of the work and the third person is doing the other half of the work, then there'll be this inevitable problem that it doesn't work. In this case, we have to wonder what we're going to do and how we're going to fix the problem. Uh, now, I literally mean I have, there are about six people who all need to talk to me about group work problems, and each of them now is thinking, oh, Richard's just talking about me. In fact, I'm not thinking of any of you, except nervously now thinking you'll be thinking I'm thinking about you, which is, <laughs> you should think about that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, but, uh, but really, this is what I always say when I talk about group work. Who was at ENGS 1000? Can someone say, what are the key points? So I don't have to give the whole ENGS. Stop thinking about palindromic squares. What's the smallest one, by the way? One? Zero. Zero. <laughs> one. 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 Okay, shh. <laughs> you should have someone's killing themselves. <laughs> um, it was funny the other day when we were... I was trying to trick you into not being sure about the Chinese remainder theorem or not. And I presented the theorem and I made it this big challenge to work out if it was right or not. And I think because it was maths, it would have freaked everyone out. But I sort of picked it in such a way that I think the second example you could possibly try if you were starting from the simplest example would instantly disprove the theorem that I was putting up. But I bet, in fact, I'm pretty sure, can just confirm it now, no one actually did that, did they? You just have to try two and two. Oh, no, two and... Uh, you have to be working... Uh, four, so you had to work two and three, or something to four. You had to just try these very, two and three, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's right, I think two and three catches you when you're working to the thing of four. Anyway, I don't think anyone tried it out. So, um, so that, that, that made me think I should encourage you to try things when I say stuff, not just thinking of complicated mathematical proofs, actually just check it out. You won't necessarily find a counterexample to what I'm saying, but maybe there is a counterexample just sitting there so close. And certainly palindromic squares, the first e example is suspiciously close to the beginning because it's zero. All right, so in Eng 1000, when I was talking about this, what did I say? What, what were the key points from that lecture at the beginning of the year? This is your exam. Eng 1000 exam, you know they said there was no exam? They were lying. The exam happens publicly in a lecture of a previous a subsequent course. Someone, that said, someone say something that I said about teamwork in Eng 1000. Someone. See, I live in this fantasy land where you remember what I said. <laughs> Is there no one that can remember anything I said? <laughs> Someone say something. Come on. Something. Teamwork. <laughs> Teamwork. What's that? The points? We played the points game. Do you remember the points game? Yeah, 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 yeah. How did the points game go? What's that? You need to... You need to persuade your friends to believe you. Certainly there is this persuasion element to making the thing work. You'll think of the X, X cross, the zero cross game. Yeah, we did play a game where... It was um, a non-zero-sum game. It was a, a negative... No, it was a zero-sum game if you played a selfish strategy, but it was a positive-sum game if you played a collective strategy. And it's, it's just an interesting psychological game. People always play collect, uh, individual strategies rather than collective strategies and never do well in that game. Though, actually, we had a surprising number of people who did do well, I seem to remember, this year. But the main point I made in the course, and um, I'm just refreshing your memory because I'm sure it's at the tip of your... No, don't call it out, I'll say it. Don't worry, put your hands down, everyone. Is... Um, I was talking about the army, and I said that in the army, there's this thing called the chain of command. Oh, yes, yeah, someone remembers it. Yeah. What did I say? Someone tell me, what did I say? If someone makes a mistake, um, the person in charge of you gets angry at you only because of their fault, because they chose you to do the job. Yes, perfect, thank you, thank you. So when the, you're in the army and you make a mistake, whose fault is it? So 
you're doing some complicated maneuver and you're a, the, what's the smallest person in the army called? A private? You're a private and um, you make a mistake and the person in charge of you gets angry with you and they blow you up. <laughs> but whose fault is it really? It's their fault. Why is it their fault? They put you on that position. They arranged the thing in such a way, they gave you that responsibility, you didn't carry out the responsibility for whatever reason. They should have anticipated that or given you more support or had mechanisms in place to control it if you stuffed up or something. So if the whole campaign was lost because of a blunder you did, well, although you're to blame, so are they because they really shouldn't have put you in that position. And their boss, who does their boss blow up? Does their boss blow up the private? No, their boss blows them up because their boss knows that it's the lieutenant that's their boss is the captain there, the lieutenant. Their boss knows it's a lieutenant who's at fault, that they should never have trusted a private to do it. And their boss blows him up completely. But all the time their boss knows who's really to blame. Themselves. Because they shouldn't have given that lieutenant that responsibility and made it so critically dependent on that. And that does it, yeah, it goes all the way up. The idea is there's no saying it's your fault. If someone stuffs up and you've arranged for it in such a way that they can stuff up, Sure, in some sense it's their fault, but in a more profound sense it's your fault. If you arrange something so it all goes terribly wrong, then you haven't arranged it very well. You have to make sure that next time you arrange it so that doesn't happen. I told you about the dog story. If a dog bites you, the dog should be put down. But if the same dog bites the same man twice, in the same situation, the man should be put down. <laughs> this idea that you should arrange things so these things don't happen. So group work is like that. When, people, when I ask people to talk about what goes wrong in group work, they're always blaming other people. They're saying, oh, the group failed because, what's your name? Chen. Chen. Because Chen. Yeah. Chen stuffed up. <laughs> I gave him the stuff to do. He didn't do it. He was supposed to give it to me at one second before the deadline, and what happened? He didn't give it to me, so now we're stuffed. It's his fault. If a group fails, that's, can everyone just go, to Chen? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, your partner asked me to do this. Yeah. You didn't really just submit things at the last second and it went wrong? No. No, okay. <laughs> um, so, here's the story. If you have, a have some insane arrangement where it's relying on everything coming together at the last second and it doesn't, because the other person's stuffed up, sure they've stuffed up, but who has really stuffed up? I have stuffed up for giving you this assignment. I like the way you're thinking. I actually have given you this assignment knowing this will happen. And I always just take a big breath when I hand out group work because I know you will stuff up. Why do I do it? Because it causes me and the tutors no end of pain. It would be so much easier to just make it all individual. Why do you think I give you group work? Because I know it's not going to work. You're going to get it wrong and it's going to cause you pain and it make you unhappy. Because it happens in real life. In real life, you will not be working by yourself. Even if you're at Google, you will not be working. You know, they're the most individualistic place ever. You will not be working by yourself. You will be working in a team. And it will be up to you to manage that team. You even have to manage your own boss. I call that managing up. And you have to manage the people under you and you have to manage the people around you. Because you depend on them getting it right for the whole thing to go right. And if they don't get it right, everything stuffs up. And you can't, when it all stuffs up, stand back and say, well, it was them, as the water's rising in submarine. Because it was you. It was everyone. It was the captain for giving an idiot the responsibility, I'm not looking at you in particular, <laughs> the responsibility for uh, closing the hatch. And it was your, his messmate's um, responsibility for not knowing that he was a raving, forgetful lunatic and keeping an eye on him whenever he had an important job. And it was his uh, fault because he didn't, have a way of remembering. It was everyone's fault. So this is how group work works. It's not about allocating blame, it's about making it work. It won't always work. And the, stre the test about the whole thing is how you deal with it when it doesn't work. Do you deal with it gracefully? Do you learn from it? Do you make plans so next time it doesn't happen? Or is it in fact the same people that always do their first submission just before the due date and then when things go wrong blame other people? A theory I've had in the past that I'll be able to, ch to check, check out with great joy because I'll be teaching you in the next course too. And I'm really hoping 
that it's not the case, that you will hand things in at the last minute twice in your whole life. Once because it by some miraculous coincidence works, you lucky devil, never does for me. And then the second time because it goes terribly wrong. And you will think, oh, next time I'll have to put processes in place to make sure I'm not depending on a string of lucky coincidences standing between me and disaster. So there are mechanisms in place. So I think group work is all about managing the group. If you have a problem, it's working out early on what the problem is and working out things to control it. Dealing with other people is always hard because they're different to you, they're autonomous, you can't be rude to them. You have no authority over your group members. So you've got a difficult thing here. You're depending on someone and you can't shout at them and make them do what you want. You can't will them to do what you want. You have to work out how to get them to do what you want. Or maybe we don't end up doing what you want. Maybe that's the outcome. But it's a hard interpersonal question. I find the best way of solving problems like this personally, if you want some tips, is frankness, early disclosure. So that's why we put you in your groups before the holidays. I would like to think that most of you, or at least some of you, got together with your teammate before the holidays and, like we asked, worked out how you were going to deal with the project. Swapped contact details, checked you had certain days blocked out in your diary, worked out how you'd communicate, worked out fallback plans, frankly discussed your strengths and weaknesses. So you worked out who was the most appropriate team leader, who was the most appropriate this or whatever, whatever. I would like to think you then kept communicating and talking the whole way through. I'd like to think it wasn't just a series of last minute, very angry emails to each other <laughs> just before the due date. And if you did that, that's fine because that's learning, but I'd like to think that that's not going to be the case next time. Because you have to make group work work. You know, one thing I did say in that talk, I'm sorry I forgot what I said in that talk, he said sarcastically. Um, but one thing I did say in that talk that I remember, because that talk that I gave earlier this year in Eng 1000 about group work occurred just after a graduate get-together, where our grad students had got together for some function and I'd gone along too to see old faces that I was very fond of, and still am, and the people attached to those faces. And, <laughs> and employers came along and all sorts of people came along. And at that meeting I met some big dude in IBM. I don't know what his actual job was. But he said he was in charge of IBM research in the Australia or South Pacific. I didn't even know we had research, IBM research in Australia. But apparently there's a lot of it happening or development. It is some very senior person in a very expensive looking suit. And he was energetic and switched on. And he was very important. I could see from his tie how important he was. <laughs> and I said to him, as I always say when I meet any employer, well, tell me about our graduates. Uh, how are they? And are there skills you would prefer them to have more of? And are there things we're teaching them that they don't need to know? And things you really wish we'd taught them more of? Because I really like our education to be you know, spot on. So when you go out, the employer goes, oh, wow, I can't believe that they're so good. Uh, and he said, you know, I don't really care about anything, because we can train them for most things. All I really care about when I interview people, as long as they're smart, and I can tell that from their grades, the thing I'm looking for once I get to the interview is just one thing. And what do you think he said it was? Teamwork. He says, I asked them, tell me what teamwork projects you've done. How did it go? It's just like my wife. And he's inviting you to get yourself removed from the job by saying it didn't go well and just complaining about it. And he's thinking, I don't want to have, because my jobs aren't going to go well either. I don't want to have someone that's complaining all the time in addition to the job not going well. I'll have enough trouble trying to make the job go well. I want someone that tries to kick the ball. That when things don't go well, they try and fix it up and solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said literally all he cared about was teamwork. He said, as far as I'm concerned, make every single assignment a group work assignment and, uh, and I'll be your friend forever. <laughs> and he invited me to his birthday party <laughs> and it was fantastic. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. And risks. Now, of course, we don't do that because we want you to have technical skills. We think technical skills are awesome, but you're good at technical skills. Yes, you are. You're awesome at technical skills. You guys are really, uh, uh, you guys are fantastic. You're really smart and switched on, and you've got energy and drive and determination, and you'll go out there and you'll rock. You will beat everyone in your technical skills. You will be fantastic. But I always think if you look at yourself as a person and think how you're moving through life and what you want out of life and things like that, that the trick is to work out what you're not good at and make yourself better at that. Don't just be a lopsided person like the arm wrestler with one big arm and the rest of you is hopeless. You've got to be a balanced person. So 
if you find group work hard, that's a good indication that it's something you should be working at. Take that as your challenge. Don't just pick the things you can do and make them your challenge. What sort of life is that? That's boring. It's not going to improve you or stretch you in any way at all. Pick things you're not good at and make them better. And I reckon if you're at all like me, one thing you'll suck at completely is group work. You should settle as your personal challenge to make your group work work. And your group work probably won't work for the project. It'll work OK. Afterwards, not for marks, just for your own benefit, you should sit down and think, why didn't the group work work? What could I have done differently? What happened? Not who's to blame. If it's anyone else, blaming someone else is just not solving the problem. What could I have done differently to make it work? You don't have to tell me, just think that yourself and then next time try doing that. Okay, now we're going to take a little break now and after the break we're going to return to talking about trees. And can I just say, because it sounded like I was complaining there about your group work, I think you guys are awesome and you're amazing and you're going to go out and do fantastic things and I'm very proud of you. And you will master group work and you will be perfect. But I think group work is what you need to work at to make it all really good. But I'm really proud of you. I'm not complaining. I think you are awesome. I cannot wait to see what you do when you graduate. Okay, so let's take a little break now and then in, um, uh, say, 10 minutes we'll return and talk about trees. Oh, hello. How are you?